So here's, here's the way it works. We could take and support like six, seven, eight missionaries, total budget, right? Total, pay everything. They don't have to go anywhere else, get all the money out of our church, right? But then we wouldn't have the opportunity to be represented throughout the world in different locations, and uh, we wouldn't, they, we, they wouldn't have as big, broad a network of people to pray for them. And if something were to happen in our church, their, their support would go away, right? So we don't do it that way. They, it's, it's, it's also kind of like a rigorous thing to raise your support. It kind of like weeds out those that, that, maybe, that maybe they're just mis, mistaken, that they're called, and they just can't get their support raised. I'm not talking about anybody in particular or anything like that. All I'm saying is these guys, all of them have at least 100 people and our churches that support them with smaller amounts, like a couple of hundred a month, and sometimes it's a family member or a friend or from high school or whatever, $50 a month, whatever. And uh, so they have a broad base of support uh, and, uh, and, and, and prayers. And when they come back, we, we get to hear from them and share. If you'll notice in your bulletin, we only have a couple of people that we support from that, the area where these people are from. And so, uh, and I've got to be careful what I say here because we're, we could be live back here any minute. And um, are we live back again? Yes, we are. Hello, people online. Welcome home. Uh, and so it's very important that we, uh, that we uh, uh, do this. And the way this works is like, look, we give our tithe, and then when the Bible, Malachi and other places the Bible talks about offerings, I believe the number one most important offering is an offering to help people that take Jesus everywhere, okay? And so that's very important. And so as you get paid, you get paid weekly or every other week or monthly, take a portion of that and give an, an offering above your tithe. Now, I notice that sometimes though somebody will mail in tithe and I kind of, I know these people that have the personality type. They're saying, God, now watch, I'm being obedient to the letter, and they give their offering, their tithe, and it's a hundred dollars thirty one, hundred and thirty one dollars, four and a half cents. I mean, it's to the point. Listen, that is not the heart of God. You know, it's not the heart of God. God wants your heart to be that you give. Just lay up your treasure, Jesus said, in heaven. And where, where moth can't uh, get to it, the rust can't get to it, where thieves can't steal it, and where there's eternal reward. Because the soul of a man matters more than something else. So when we talk about giving, the way that we do that, we give it into a general missions fund, and then we're able to support missionaries. Like I was having a conversation with Dick, she says, look, I was, I was like, a, I'm a ranger, I'm a forest ranger. I was called into missions as a forest ranger, and now I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I do, you know? And so, uh, so anyway, eek. And um, so we'll go back and, and delete that little segment right there in a minute. So uh, take that name off later before you put that up. So, um, so, you know, but the thing is, is, you know, that some people can't preach, and they, you know, that's just not their thing. And so if we just individually decide, I think I'll give all of my missions dollars to this person, then we're all excited because the pulpiteer, the guy that can preach up a storm, he gets all the money, but the workhorse is in an orphanage somewhere, you know, and is leading hundreds of children every year to Jesus, right? They, get, they will get no support and they'll never be there. So that's why we put it in a fund and then we distribute it to the missionaries, not just based on who's the most talented from a pulpit. How many understand what I'm saying? Because everything is not glamorous. And we have several people like in, in Colombia and other places in South America where, you know, you're, you're not supporting them because they're this great orator and preacher type person. No, they're a great worker and they're building a great work and they're doing a great job for God. So we give consistently a little extra. Did you know that we have uh, almost 4,000 giving units in this church. You think about this. If every, every one would give five more dollars a week to missions, five times 4,000 is 200,000. Is that right? How much? 20,000? 20, 20,000. Okay. Five times 4,000. But that's, five, that's just in one week. 20,000 times 52 is over a million more, 
right? $5 a week. So in one week, 4,000 people given an extra five is 20,000. If you did it every week, you got 52 weeks of $20,000 more for missions. So do I think that we've tapped out our giving? No. And if you're not giving anything to missions, start somewhere. Give $5 a week, $10 a week, $20 a week. Because a lot of churches don't care and their pastors are afraid to talk about it. You know why? They don't want to run anybody out of the church. Let me tell you something. I didn't come here to build attendance. Okay? I love and care about each one of you and your spiritual life. I came here to build people. I didn't come here to build buildings. I came here to build people. And if I can't build in you the heart of God to feel how God feels about things and to see things the way God sees, then I failed. And let me tell you what. Here's how God feels about the people that are lost around the world. He gave his only son that whosoever believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And let me tell you something. God will honor, always honor missions giving and missions giving churches. Always he honors it. I remember we, I started the church here October 7, 1990. And we built a, a new sanctuary in 95 and went into it. And so I'm very concerned. I hate debt. So we were looking at that in, in uh, 1999, about January. And I announced to the church, I said, on our 10-year anniversary, October of the year 2000, we're going to take an offering, and I'd calculated it out because I do have a degree in business, and I'd figured it out, and I figured somewhere between eighty and a hundred thousand dollars cash offering, boom, debt taken care of. I thought, wow, won't that be great? No more debt on our building. Then I went and messed up. Sam Johnson, that missionary, talk fast talking, gun slinging, gospel preacher, he got a hold of me, took me to Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, and I went there, and that 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 place needs a Bible college. And I got there, and he got us preacher. He said, now, I just want you to do something simple. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do at the close of the service. Just pray, God, what would you have me give? And so he challenged us preachers. What would you have your church give? What can you believe me for? What can you believe, God, to do through your people? And so at first I thought 10000 Well, at that point, and my, I was frustrated by how much our church was given to missions. At that point, the most we'd given in a whole year is 38000 So I'm thinking 10000 that's a lot. Well, it's over the next two years. Boy, I couldn't get peace about that. I was praying on the way back on that miserable flight from Ethiopia, and the Holy Spirit getting all over me, and I thought, okay, 25, 25. I'm bargaining with God. I'll do 25. Over two years, we can do that. 25,000. I wonder what my deacons will think about that. And I know they're southern farm boys, so they're a little bit conservative. I thought, they're going to think I'm crazy. But he said, no, that's not enough. 50,000. 50,000? We've never given but 38,000 for a whole year. So then I'm thinking, plus, we got this building debt and everything. What, what are we going to do? And so I was sitting there, and I said, okay, we'll give, tw try to give 25000 this year, 25000 next year. It's just a goal. If we don't meet it, hey, I'm just stepping out in faith. I'm going to walk on the water. So I, I said, okay. So that's what I told them. So that's what we're going to try to do. I got back. The deacons looked at me like I was crazy just a little bit, which I thought I might be a little bit too. I took my own temperature that day. And so I... So, you know, we had been planning this miracle building offering a year and five months from that June when I got back, June of 99, 1999, that in 2000 of October, it was this miracle offering. So the Lord spoke to me, take, don't just do it in two years, but take a cash offering for it in the nine-year anniversary. Some of you were here. Raise your hand if you're here, and I'm telling the truth. Raise your hand. Hold it high up there, way up there. So the rest of you don't know this story, this is ridiculous. I should have told it a long time ago. So that nine-year anniversary, we took a cash offering for, for the Bible College in Ethiopia. Pastor Jeff, you remember it. 60, I got, I got the, this big check made out of styrofoam in my, in my garage still, made out to the Ethiopia Bible College. 60, I think it was 67,600 and something dollars in one offering cash. I was blown away. And from that moment, the I in June of 99 announced that we were going to take that offering for that Bible college. Our church began to grow, and the money began to grow, and the money began to grow. And by June of 2000, the building was paid off. We never took an offering on our 10-year anniversary because God paid off the building because we put missions first. And that's what God will do because he honors missions giving. <laughs> Amen? And he'll do it to you. He's no debtor. He's no debtor. He's no debtor. 
Well, the message title is Pray, Give, and Go. How many saw Baylor play terrible? That's because the men's coach, the men's coach makes his players nervous in big games. He tenses them up. They played like they drank 40 gallons of coffee. They were never in control. They were out of balance. They were throwing shots up before they were controlled. They were dribbling the ball off their nose. They were awful. Absolutely terrible. But the women's coach, she knows she's got poise. They won. Yeah, they won by 40. I'm telling you, that, that, those people can play. Those girls, they're playing tonight, and I'll be in mission service. So don't you worry. I gotta, I'll walk, watch it after the fact. So nobody come up to me and tell me about who won that game, okay? The winner goes to Final Four. All right. But here's why the men didn't win. They don't know anything about giving and going. How many of you know basketball? You give and go. You play together. You give, you go. These guys are going. We're giving. And we go to our neighborhood, to our schools, to our neighbors, to our relatives, to our workplaces. We go too. But nothing works without prayer. And so I titled it Pray, Give, and Go. But perhaps the title should have been Don't Pray, Don't Give, and Don't Go. It's catchier. It's a catchy title. It resonates through the larger sections of the lukewarm Christian community in America. Don't pray because you're not committed to pray. We believe in the power of the human spirit to dig itself out of a hole and construct a brave new humanity. We believe in the spiritual evolution, the ability of the human spirit to defeat the demons that lie within us and evolve into autonomous, rational beings fit to rule the world. We're full of optimism because education is the key to progress. We live in hope that one day, we will get the politicians that we deserve. Oops, it might have already happened. Don't pray because life is too busy. Don't pray because the mortgage demands an extraordinary long and exhausting day. Don't pray because Facebook's more rewarding. Don't pray because, well, admit it, that's taking religion just a little bit too seriously. And definitely don't pray in your retirement years because God might call you away, away from the pleasures owed to you after a lifetime of hard work in the workforce. And then don't give to missions because if you did give, that would mean you've been praying. Greed is good because God wants his people to be showered with blessing and prosperity and every material thing that life has to offer. Buy a larger house, go on exotic holidays, go on weekend trips, pay for every whim that your children have, anything and everything, from the arts to travel to school events to every sport that's ever created, every sport. Involve them in everything because after all, your children are the most important thing in the world to you. Then come to church and thank God for such wonderful things. There are many reasons why we shouldn't give to missions. The economics is easy. If you give money, if you give it away, then it's not yours anymore. And if I preach don't give, nobody would leave her saying, all he wants, that church wants, is my money. And it's a win-win for me. And now here's the real chestnut. Don't go. Who in their right religious mind would pack the bags and head off to some ill-forgotten third world country in a remote part of the globe. We know that God saves he who he wants to save. So why does he need me to go off there, sell my house, and learn a new language when everybody ought to be speaking English anyway? <laughs> so a great sermon title would be Don't Pray, Don't Give, and Don't Go. It'd be great because everyone would leave here feeling good. And most of the Western church has already been doing this for a long time. So it's a tried and tested formula. What do you think? You'd probably say you disagree with all that I'm saying, but let me ask you a question. Do you pray and intercede for missionaries and for the lost? Do you give to missions? And is your heart open to go? For the Bible says, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 16, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded to you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. 
I want you to notice what Jesus said there. He said, make disciples. You see, it's one thing to share the good news that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life, was God, God incarnate, he was born of a virgin. He came, he lived sinless, he died on the cross, he was buried in the grave. The third day he rose again and he appeared to so many, then he ascended up into heavens and, and that's the gospel, simple gospel right there. And he's praying for you and I and he loves you and he's offering you eternal life. And he is, that's true. That's easy, we get that, don't we? But you know what Jesus said? He says, make disciples. He didn't say just tell them the good news. That's part of it. But now we teach them to observe all things I've commanded. And that's hard work. That's what these guys do is hard work. That's what we should be doing. In other words, you get in intricately, personally involved in someone's life and you talk them through, you teach them, you walk through life with them, you help them flesh out their faith and what that looks like where the rubber meets the road and how you live your life. And that when you're making a disciple, someone that you've taught to walk with God. And he says, and to observe everything I've commanded, to obey everything I command. Oh, but that's legalism. Even in giving, it's legalism. Oh, well, just a minute, just a minute. Do you think the New Testament requires less than the Old Testament? You think after Jesus came and died on the cross and rose again that God suddenly goes, all that stuff I said thou shalt not and thou shalt do, that no longer applies. Free ticket, everybody eat, drink, and be merry. We all get to go to heaven, universal salvation. You're all there? Absolutely not. Did you know that Jesus was a Pharisee? How many of you knew that? The Pharisees were a branch, just like you say evangelicals. Now, there's evangelicals, there's this group of evangelicals, this group of evangelicals, and this group of evangelicals. And Jesus' a particular group of Pharisee was the Hasidics, the Hasids, Hasid. How many of you know, you've seen them in New York City, you see them in Israel, they've got the long tasselly hair that comes down here. They're marked by that. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Now, the, the current Hasids, the Hasidic community, Jewish community, the current one is not what Jesus was. The ancient Hasidic people, here's what their motto was. You go way beyond, that's why they, because the law says you cut your hair never be, above the middle of the ear, so they always would do it longer. Well, of course, they have the law still on stones, but we have the Spirit, the law is written on our heart, and the Holy Spirit leads us, and Christ is within us. But they, the, the, the Hebrews who have not, the, the Jewish people who have not accepted Jesus as Messiah, they only have the law external, and yet they do a better job than many of us with the external law than we do living when we have the Holy Spirit and Christ embedded in the law written on our hearts. How many know what I'm talking about? Why? Because we don't live in the fear of God that someday God's going to judge those, both the wicked and the righteous. We don't live with this awe of God knowing that what God says, he says, thou shalt not, and he meant it. Thou shalt, and he meant it. And you see, Jesus, you see in his teachings, he, he, he wants to go farther than the minimum requirement. Remember, he says, the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say you don't lust in your heart. It's beyond that. Don't even look. Don't even think. He says, the law says that, uh, the, you know, the, the, and when he talked, when he criticized the Pharisee, it was the religious leaders of the Pharisees. It was a small group of them that he was criticizing. Okay? And he says, the law says, that, that, I mean, these, they, they were proud that they were paying every bit of their tithe. Why? They did that only because of religious pride. He says, when you give alms, when you give, don't be doing it to brag up with what you're doing around everybody. When you pray, don't do it so you can be seen of men. When you fast, don't put a look on your face so everybody knows what you're doing. Just do what you're going to do before God and do it well. And then he says, if someone asks you to go a mile, go two with them. Well, that was a part of the custom of the day. And a good Pharisee, a good ascetic person, they, they, they would take a duty. When somebody would come along the carrying, they would say, I will help you bear your load. I'll take it a mile. So that actually comes from the custom of the Jews. And you see that in rabbinical writings. And so he says, don't just go one mile, go two miles. So I'm gonna tell you something. We need to search our heart and see how important it is that like Paul said, he said it this way, to live is Christ, to, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I count my life as dung, as nothing except to the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, all of my life is about God. It's about Christ. But we just make Sunday. We make it about Sunday. I remember Keith Green had the song, you know, I want more than Sundays and Wednesday nights. And if you can't come to me every day, then don't bother coming at all. 
You see, this is a relationship with Jesus where we walk with him and talk with him. He tells us that we're on. We listen to him. He's with us. He empowers us. He resurrects us from death and, and to life, a new life, a new man. Old things are put away. Christ is powerful. His saving power doesn't just cleanse and forgive sin. It changes hearts. It moves in. It's powerful. And we rise up, and we're more than conquerors. We're victorious in Christ. We have the life of God in us, and we have the power to go and be witnesses by his spirit like it says in acts 2 jesus said you'll have you'll be my witnesses so should we pray does it make a difference i say yes we should we number one is we pray when we get our heads in the bible we quickly see that that our secular society is delirious that the church world is watered down it's a religious spirit thing that's not of god you know the bible quickly tells us that god's hearts for the lost it's not his will that anybody perish, that no one go to hell. It's will, his will that everyone repent and turn from the rebellion. It's his will that we have the passion of God for the loss that God himself had when he gave his son for the loss. That's his will. And you see, when you get God's heart in you, you feel and think and pray the way God would pray and feel and think. You carry out, you bring forth what God is doing in you. That's exactly who Jeremiah was. He was the weeping prophet. And he looked at Israel. He saw their rebellion. He saw their arrogance. He saw their sinfulness. And in Jeremiah 4.22, he, 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 he says, my people are fools. They do not know me. He's speaking for God. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They do not know how to do good. You can hear God directly praying and engaging the problem through Jeremiah. And that's what happens. We see what God sees when the Holy Spirit comes in us. We feel about it the way God feels about it in this lostness of this world. Jeremiah in Jeremiah 4.19 says, he weeps for his people because God is weeping. Look, oh my anguish. My anguish, I writhe in pain. Oh, the agony of my heart. In Jeremiah 8, 21, since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn, and horror grips me. You see, and then he prays. He prays exactly what God is lying within him, what God desires that all of us pray and that all the people then would pray. And Jeremiah 3, 23 says, yes, we will come to you for you are the Lord our God. That's what he wants to hear from you today. I come to you for you're the Lord our God. Surely the idolatrous commotion on the hills and mountains is a deception. Surely the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. He is your salvation and mine, our rock in whom we trust. You see, God has a heart for missions, and he desires that we be people that pray. Paul confronts the religious, the religious people in Athens, the Athenians, and he's told them in Acts 17, 31, he says, For God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he's given proof of this to all men by raising him up from the dead. You see, there is an accounting day that's coming. There's a day that God's going to say, what did you do with your time? What did you do with your heart? What did you do with your call? And some of you young men may floundering around. You're not sure what to do. You're doing this. You're doing that. You have no direction. Why? Because maybe you haven't found what God wants to do because you're not listening and his purposes aren't your primary heart. But you need to go after God and hear God. Maybe God wants to send you to a foreign land, raise you up that you would go. But in the meantime, be a people that pray. When we pray, it stirs the unregenerate hearts to be praying for God's will. We pray God's will in reference to missions, and it's saying we refuse to accept what is normal, what is perverse in our secular society. We pray God's heart when we do that. We pray against every evil, selfish agenda, every scheme, every interpretation, which is at odds in the norms that God originally established for the world. Prayer is difficult for us. Because too many times there's too many competing voices, what we shall eat, what we shall wear, uh, where we shall sleep. But Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But too many voices said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. And we forget that there's something that how short life is and how short we have to make a difference that's eternal difference. Let me tell you something. We are all dying quick. Sister Yulstead is 95, and if you're not... You are today. And Sister Yulstead, are you listening to me? You're, are you 95? Are you 95? 94? You're 95, close enough. So 
20, 20 lifetimes will take us back to Jesus. That, that's pretty close to when Jesus was on earth. 20 100-year lives. So you stack them. It's very close to when Jesus was on earth. You understand? And listen, life goes boom. And some of you, you can tell and you remember when you were young and your mind thinks that way, but you can't move. I remember when I could shoot basketball and I could stand flat-footed and jump up and stuff that thing. And if I'd have been on Baylor, South Carolina would have never beat us. <laughs> you always get better the older you get, you know? But I'm dying. My time, my days are numbered, my years are numbered, and so are years. And so what we must do, we must do quickly to make an eternal impact. And this is it. God, give us your heart. The heart of God is missions. He gave his son, Jesus, to bring this gospel to the world. And so we pray. And the next thing we do, we have to give. And giving sacrificially, you must first give in obedience. So just don't forget that. So if you're not willing to honor God with his program to give to the, the church's furnace, say, well, I, I believe that's legalistic. It can be if your heart is wrong. It's never legalistic if your heart's not wrong. Because if your heart's not, if your heart's right, then all of your treasures are God's laid up. And you give beyond. You don't, you're not measuring what's the minimum, what do I have to give? No, you're giving. Are you with me? And so giving sacrificially is giving above and beyond as God blesses you. Giving sacrificially means missing the money you would otherwise have. The Bible has a lot to say about money, storing up treasures in heaven, and about generously supporting others in need, and about going into all the world, and that costs money and time. The underlining principle is what Jesus did, and he mentions it, mentions it in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Look at this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might be made rich. So that when you give out of your resources consistently, regularly, weekly, monthly, however you do it, and you give when you have a resource, a pool, when you have a storehouse of money, and you reach into that and go, hey, I'm going to help the church reach this $100,000 goal, and I'm going to write a big check. Maybe you've never written it that. I remember the first time I wrote a check for $10,000 to missions. I remember that. It was Back then, phew, that was something, I'm telling you. But I'm telling you what, God honors and God will bless and God will take care of you. He's never a debtor to anyone. So give as generously as you can as the Spirit allows you to missions. But we can't stop there because there's a lot of young men and women in our church and old people who are retiring and people everywhere. And the Bible says go. And if God calls you to go, you need to make yourself willing. It may not be to a foreign land, but there's something you can do that's about winning souls find God's plan. See, every one of these guys, they find a plan. Maybe it's to teach English. Maybe it's through a coffee shop. Maybe it's through home group thing. There's, there's a plan. They figure out something to do to meet a social need, to meet a person, so that then they love them in a tangible way so they can give them Jesus. And guess what? It works in America. Get the people around you that need something. Meet their need. Bring them. Ask God to show you what can you do to win the loss because we are called to go in our neighborhoods, at our work, in our school place, in our families. We are called to give them the gospel and make a difference. You believe that? And let me tell you what. If you got God's heart, you care about the lost souls, and you'll give, and you'll go, and you'll pray. Otherwise, you're like that first bunch that I talked about. Why do that? Let's don't go. Let's don't give. Let's don't pray because it's just a lot easier. Somebody here is being called to missions this morning. Hear the call of God for your life. St. Augustine, and I close with this, said, a whole Christ for my salvation, a whole Bible for my staff, a whole church for my fellowship, and a whole world for my parish. Let's not be satisfied with anything less as we consider God's claim on our life and the call to take Jesus to the whole world. We partner with great people. In Acts chapter two, it ends and the Holy Spirit has just come and they're full of God. And they met daily together, they prayed, they broke bread together, they studied the word, they met each other's needs as they had and everything's, everything was common. Let me tell you something, these people that are here as our guests today, are gonna be sharing eight minutes each. There's five of them, 40 minutes every year. Those that actually come on Sunday night, they walk away going, wow, 
most powerful event there is. And I want you to look at you. I'm looking at you. I'm not just saying this to the air. I'm talking to each one of you individually. You be here tonight because this is a community and these are our representatives and they're going where maybe we can't go. And we need to give them respect and encourage them. There should be standing room only. And unless you have to work or unless you have to do something else, you should be in the house of God. This place should be jam-packed. Because if you have the heart of missions, you love missionaries. A church that's full of the Spirit loves people that are missionaries. You hear what I'm saying? And you should be here. Don't you laze around. A Baylor women, that game, it'll wait. Right? You can pull it up online. You can watch it. Besides that, if I go watch the game, they're going to lose. If I'm here supporting these missionaries, they're going to win. Right? Say amen. amen. I heard one. All right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have the musicians come. We're going to sing a hymn of commitment, Take My Life and Let It Be. It's not an easy hymn to sing. And I know this church is giving. Why would, you, why would a church our size be number 30 nationally in the Assemblies of God and World Missions? Because you already give. But guess what? I, I do not believe for a minute that everybody here gives anything for missions every year. And we have, in this weekend, we're going to have nine people from that region that is very sensitive, and they risk their lives, okay? We're going to have nine people here, and what we want to do is we want to be able to pick them all up and support them every month. So if I can get everyone to increase $5 a week or even $5 a month, or maybe you're giving nothing, you start giving $10 a month, you'll never miss it. But it makes a huge difference for these people, and your heart, God will honor it. He'll honor it. When you lose a job, how? How? You find a job. You get it. Why? Because God knows He's going to give through you. You start a business, He's going to bless the socks off of it. Why? Because you're a conduit like a river, man. That, that money flows through you to the kingdom of God, laying up treasures in heaven. Amen? But if you just want a bigger fat Cadillac and another cruise, another uh, bigger house, you know, and buy your kids every brand name piece of clothing there is so that they... You know, because your, your, your ego and your identity is caught up in how they look. You know, look, you're ugly. Your kids are cute, but when they get old, they're going to be ugly. You can dress them up in fancy clothes, right? That's a joke, okay? That was a joke. All humor, 100% joke, except maybe a couple of exceptions, okay? A couple of exceptions. All right. So let's have the ushers come. Would you pray right now? God, what do you have me do? I prayed earlier between services and I wrote out a check that I feel like God wanted me to do. I thought in my head before I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this amount, but after I prayed, I ended up giving double that amount. What God wants you to do. These next two weekends, I'll be receiving money bless these missionaries and bless the Speed the Light projects in a certain land. Okay? Father, in Jesus' name, bless your people. I know some are really struggling financially. And God, you're a provider. Our church is generous. We did another dollar blessing. The last four weeks, we've done them to help people that have had medical problems and things come up that are unexpected and just put them in the hole and there's so much financial stress they don't know what to do. And God, you bless that way. But you know what, Lord? We know that you're our provider. And Lord, you flow through your people and you honor it and you make provision and we're never gonna miss it. So God bless your people as they give this weekend and next. Bless them, Lord, and bless these people that are our representatives around the world. In Jesus' name, amen.